Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you turn to the book of John, thank you, fellas. John, the fourth chapter, is where we're going to head this morning. John, the fourth chapter. John chapter number 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 27. I want to give you a little uh, background leading up to this passage. What we find is that the Lord is being led uh, to go through Samaria. Uh, It was an unlikely place for a Jew to be found. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Uh, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to a place called Samaria, and it was there that uh, Jesus would encounter a woman at the well. Friends, I want to tell you something. God climbs over every barrier that man puts up. God climbs over every barrier to reach every person because that's the heart of the Father. And he's there in Samaria, he's sharing with this lady, and her eyes, spiritual eyes are beginning to be open, and she's beginning to understand who he is, and he begins to tell her everything about her life. And it's about that time that he's uh, giving this revelation of everything that's going on. I want to remind you, Jesus knows everything that's going on in your life, friend. We often view that in a negative sense in our lives, but it's also a very positive sense. He knows everything you're confronted with. He knows every difficulty you're faced with. He knows every frustration that you have today. He knows the anxieties and the fears uh, that you are confronted with in life. And I want to tell you, he is the answer still today for our lives. It's about this time, though, as he is talking with this lady that the disciples come walking up, and that's where... Our passage picks up this morning. If you'll look there with me, beginning in verse 27. Just then his disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and a harvest, a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. This morning I want us to focus our attention on verse number 35 where Jesus said, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Jesus' challenge to his disciples was to open their eyes. One of the things we often find Jesus doing is talking about the things of the kingdom of heaven while the disciples at the same time were talking about the things of earth. You will find that Jesus was on a heavenly mission while the disciples were on an earthly mission. Verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria. There was a divine appointment that God had for Jesus in Samaria. The disciples, on the other hand, in verse 8, says they had gone away to buy some food. They finally find Jesus, and that's where our passage picks up this morning. In verses 31 and 32, they 
urge him to eat. They know he's been ministering all throughout the day, and they know that physically he's going to be weary and tired and wore out. And so they tried to encourage him. They went and bought this food. They tried to encourage him to sit down and eat. And his response that he gave them was this, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and uh, you were talking about two totally different things? In thinking about preparation for today, I thought probably the area this happens the most is in a marriage. The husband thinks the wife's talking about something and he's absolutely wrong. I'm not going to ask you how many of y'all ever been in that place, but we'll just let that kind of settle in for a minute. You could be in a conversation and you think somebody's talking about one thing and they're talking about something totally different. That's what's going on in this story we find with Jesus and the disciples. Jesus continues on in verse 34 and he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he progresses on and we find his words in verse 35. He says, open your eyes and look at the fields. Open your eyes and look around you. Friends, we often see the world only through earthly eyes, but we don't see it through the eyes of the heavenly father. Our eyes only see the things that are going on around us today, the trouble that's in our world, the wars and the rumors of wars the troubles and the calamity that has been caused through ISIS, the unrest in our nation. We have recently elected a new president and probably uh, uh, no other time in my life do I remember a time after election where there's so much unrest in our country today. The media is up in arms. Groups are up in arms. There's lots of things happening right now in our world. Financial troubles, health-related troubles. Violence and strife fill our streets. Heroin is continuing to take out life after life after life after life. I was awestruck this week as it seems like continually I keep seeing obituaries and it's young people in their 20s and we know that the enemy is working so desperately to try to steal, kill, and destroy. We know there's so many troubles around us today. And often, that's where all of our attention goes, is the trouble around us. Jesus called the disciples, friends, and the call for us today was to open our eyes, to not let the obvious things around us totally occupy our attention, but rather open our eyes to see what's going on around us spiritually. I think often in the church world, we're praying, Lord, open my eyes so that I can see what's going on. Kind of like the story, we know that uh, the man named Saul on the road to Damascus had an experience with God. The Bible tells us there was a really bright light, and because of that bright light, he was temporarily blinded. Well, a few days later, a man by the name of Ananias came to pray for him, and the Bible says something almost like scales fell off his eyes, and he was able to see again. I think often in the church world, we're kind of like that. We're saying, Lord, open my eyes so I can see the world the way you do. Lord, take the scales off my eyes so I can see. But Jesus didn't say, you need me to do this for you. He said, listen, you just need to open your eyes and look around you. What Jesus was saying is if you'll take the time and the effort to open your eyes and look around you, you'll see the harvest field all around you. Listen to the words of that passage of verse 35 through the Message Bible. It says, as you look around you right now, wouldn't you say it's about four months and it'll be time for the harvest? Well, I tell you to open your eyes, take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. Jesus didn't say you need another spiritual miracle to be able to see. He said you need to get your eyes off of yourself and off of your own circumstances and see what's going on around you. Now, friends, I tell you this. When we'll open our eyes, one of the things, first of all, we'll see is this, the Father's heart. We'll see the Father's heart. You see, the heart of the Father is what missions is all about. Next Sunday, we're going to have our missions convention together. 
And the one thing you'll find is the basis of missions, the basis of you and I being a witness and sharing the gospel with others comes from the heart of the Father. You might ask, well, what is our mission? Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Friend, that's the mission of the church. And I've often shared with you the church is not this building. You see, this building is just uh, some stud walls, some drywall, some electrical wires, some lights, some carpeting, some trim, some paint on the walls. That's about all that it is. The church is you. When you come in, the church is really here. You see, all week long, I'm in this building, but the church is not here. The church happens when all of you come through the doors and we gather together. So if missions is the call of the church, really what we're saying is missions is the call for you and missions is the call for me. You see, that's the heart of God for his people. It's the heart of the Father that drives the mission. We see it throughout the Bible, John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone. Somebody say everyone. Amen. Wanting everyone to come to repentance. We see the heart of the Father. It's in action through Jesus. Jesus continually told the disciples, I have not come to do my will. I've not come to do what I want. I've not come for my own dreams and my own aspirations. He said, I've come to do the will of my Father who has sent me. And as a direct result of that mission, we constantly see him in ministry to people like this Samaritan woman who's by the well. We see ministry that Jesus does to a man by the name of Bartimaeus, a man who was blind. Nicodemus, another man. He's the one that Jesus said, you must be born again. To a paralyzed man laying by the pool at Bethesda, Jesus was the answer. It was Jesus Christ who was the answer to the demoniac of the Gadarenes. You see, the heart of the Father was compassion for people. People in need of salvation from sin. Throughout the Gospels, we continually see the compassion of the Father reaching through Jesus. And my friend, I want to challenge you today. The compassion of the Father is still the same. And God wants to work the compassion of his heart through you and through me. Because there's people around us every day that need to know God loves me. God cares about me. God has a plan for me. Where I'm at is not where I always have to be. God can do something in my life and turn my circumstances circumstance and situation around he wants to work his compassion through us look in Matthew 9 and verse 36 when he saw the crowds the Bible says he had compassion on them in Matthew 14 and 14 the word says he had compassion on them and healed their sick Matthew 15 and 32 I have compassion Jesus said for these people in Mark 1 and 41, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Friend, that's the heart of the Father. It was the heart of the Father that drove Jesus to do everything that he did. Friends, you and I are to win our world for Jesus Christ. The reality is Jesus is soon to return. The rapture of the church is not far off. It's close on the horizon. And if we're going to reach this world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ, friends, we're going to have to have the heart of the Father. We've got to have the heart of compassion that comes from God. You see, to have compassion for them and to see him the way he sees them, to touch people the way he wants to touch people. That's the heart of the Father. 
It will compel you and I to be missionaries to Grant County. The people of Africa, the people of South America, the people of the islands of Vanuatu are no more lost than the people right here in Grant County. The people of East St. Louis are in no worse condition than the people right here in Grant County, right here in Gas City, Indiana, Marion, Indiana, Jonesboro, Anderson, Liberty Center, wherever you may live, friend. I want to tell you, those people in Africa are no lost than the people that you live around every day. They're no more lost than your coworkers and your neighbors. They, too, need to hear the gospel message. A friend of mine several years ago was heading up north, and as he did, he needed to buy some gas. And so on the way up, he stopped in Wabash. And as he's standing there and he's filling up the vehicle with gas, and I don't know if you're like I am, but when I do that, I kind of spaced off and, you know, thinking about everything else except what I need to be thinking about. And as he's standing there filling up the vehicle with gas, all of a sudden a lady walks up and says, hey, I want to introduce myself. I am a missionary to Wabash. He was blown away. Now, this friend of mine knows Jesus, and so they were able to rejoice together about the Lord. But he was so challenged that somebody would say, you know what? God's called me to be a missionary to Wabash. Can I tell you, wherever you live, God's called you to be a missionary wherever you live. Whatever the workplace is, whatever sign is over the door where you work, that's where God's called you to be a missionary. Whatever school you attend, that's where God's called you you to be a missionary, whatever neighborhood you live in, God's called you to be a missionary to your neighborhood. You see, that's the heart of the Father. He wants to reach out and to touch people. Our eyes, friends, must be open so that we can see our community the way he is. But you know what? Here's what happens. I get so busy in Jerry's life. I get so busy with the things that Jerry's got to do. I got so busy running here running there, doing this, doing, dreaming about this, dreaming about that, that often I go through my day and I never see the people I come in contact with the way Jesus sees them. Jesus' words was, you and I don't need a miracle. We just need to stop. Open our eyes and look. The harvest fields all around us. Friend, do you know people that don't know Jesus? The harvest field's ripe. Do you know people who haven't experienced salvation in Jesus Christ? Well, if that's the case, you're right smack in the middle of the right harvest field. God wants to use you. And you know something, not only when our eyes are open do we see the heart of the Father, but the other thing we'll find out is that God always uses people. This is a truth that is, I'll be honest with you, is so profound, it baffles my thinking. You know, today you and I serve the Almighty God. I mean, we're talking about you and I serve the God who spoke the world into existence. He's the one that holds everything in place. You know, I am often blessed when I'm driving down the road and the radio's on and I hear uh, the so there's a song called My Redeemer Lives. And I want to share the words with you from that song. Listen to this. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? Who told the ocean, you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to hide until evening? Whose words alone can catch a falling star? For I know that my Redeemer lives. And the very same God that spins things in orbit runs to the weary, the worn, and the weak. And the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken, they have conquered death and they bring me victory. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Friend, I am often amazed as I look around me at the handiwork of God. I was challenged this week. I was driving down the road. In fact, I was relaying this story to Paula on the way into the church this morning. You know, often we struggle. Men and women struggle with uh, with creation and the, the challenge that comes to it through the, uh, the thought of evolution. But, you know, I was so challenged this week when I thought about the sun. The sun has always been out there burning. It's always being renewed. It never runs out of fuel source. 
It continues to burn, and every day we get light and we get health as a result of it. And friend, why does it do it and never run out of fuel? Because my God's the one that told it to burn in the beginning. And my God knows how long it needs to burn, and he'll keep it burning until he says it's time for it to be done. God will continue to do it because that's the kind of God we serve. But you know what's amazing? We serve a God who can speak one word and things come into being. But when it comes to the mission of this world and finishing the work that Jesus began on this earth, God didn't choose to speak a word. God didn't choose to create something. Actually, what God chose is for you and for me to accomplish his work. The one thing, it baffles my mind. I'm humbled. I'm awestruck that the God who could do anything would put this important work in my hands. Now, I think we'd all agree today that God's mission to see the world be saved is the most important thing in this world. It's more important than the economy. It's more important than who's in the White House. It's more important than what's going on in our streets. It's more important than what's happening with Russia or China or any other nation. Because you see, when this life is over, the only thing that's going to matter is do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And the truth is, that important truth, God has placed in our hands as believers. Now, in the past, there's been men like Isaiah, who when challenged by the awesomeness of God's presence, found God to say, you know what? We need somebody to go. Who can we send? And Isaiah stood up in the middle and said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Men like Jeremiah, who in a day of spiritual decay, and friends, if you think we're living in spiritual decay, we're living in nothing compared to what it was in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah stood up at a day of spiritual decay and said, Lord, I'll answer the call. I'll be your voice. I'll speak for you. Women like Mary, who when God wanted to bring the Savior of the world in, he would do, through, do it through a young woman by the name of Mary. She said, may it be to me as you've spoken, Lord. When you look at the lives of Paul, Peter, James, and John, all of them answered the call. They were all missionaries. So I want to ask you today, who will God send as a missionary to the place he's put you? Who will God use as a missionary in your known world? Who will God send as a missionary to Gas City? Who will God send as a missionary to the factory or the store where you work? Who will God send to your known world? Friends, as a church, we are a sending station. We're sending out missionaries. We have 18 missionaries that we're supporting today, literally around the world, and they're taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. But listen to me, friends. It's not enough for us to send them out. It's not like we have our chair here and we say, you know what? I opened up my wallet. I gave some money to support missions and they're going. So they're doing their part and I'm doing my part and I never do anything but get out and sit in my seat. How many know they're never going to hear the Bible says unless somebody tells them? How can they be saved if somebody never shares the gospel with them? Listen, I know you come faithfully to the house of God, and I'm always so, uh, uh, I enjoy time together with you in the house of the Lord. But listen, you and I are only here together for an hour and 45 minutes, maybe two hours a week, and that's it. That's not the only time the church does what the church does. This really, if you will, Sunday is kind of like a spiritual pep rally. It's kind of like all the believers that come together. We're all declaring who our God is. We're all talking and testifying about the goodness of God. And then what we do is we go out and we live out what we've been testifying about here. We go out. Listen, friend. Oh, Jesus, give me the words today. Yes, you give me the words. It doesn't do any good to testify how great God is if the only time you say it is in the church with other believers. The light is already shining here. The light needs to shine out where it's dark. Now, it's great to say, oh, God's done good things in my life. But, friends, if you're only telling other believers, honestly, you're just preaching to the choir. They already know it. 
You need to tell people who need to hear it. You need to tell people, listen to what Jesus has done in my life. Let me tell you for a moment how Jesus has turned my life around. Let me tell you for a moment the miracle he's done in me. Maybe some of y'all been healed and you're going to say, you know what? Jesus healed my body. You might say, you know what? This is where my life used to be taking me. And because of Jesus Christ, this is where my life is going now. We've got to share the gospel. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been called to be a missionary to your known world. How will God speak of his love to your neighbor if not through you? How will your coworker know about Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life if you don't tell him? The words of Christ ring out loud and clear. Open your eyes. Go into all the world. And make disciples. Missions happens through people. People like you and me. Sometime back I found this statistic and it said that it is estimated that 97% of believers never share their faith in Christ with anybody else. Now, we share our faith one with another in the church what I'm talking about is outside the church. 97% down. The truth is, I didn't, I didn't gather the statistics. But even if, if it was only 50%, what if it was only 30% of believers? Imagine what might happen in our community if more believers begin to share their, their faith. What might happen at your workplace if you begin to tell others about what Jesus Christ has done in your life? Listen, friend, if you want to encourage yourself and if you want to turn your salvation experience on fire, just tell somebody else what Jesus has done in your life. It's one of the greatest things you can do, especially when you get saved. That's a great thing. But let me tell you something. Don't get to the place where you say, you know what? 25 years ago, Jesus did that for me, and I haven't told that story in a long, long time. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ with all you come in contact with. May it be said of us that we were not of the 97%. If God's work gets accomplished in Grant County, it will get done through his people. God's already sent Jesus. The answer's already been given. We just got to declare it. So what's at stake? What if... What if we continue to be 97% who never share our faith with others? What's the big deal? What's the big deal, Pastor? Why, why, Why the pressure? Because Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 tells us this. Anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast in the lake of fire and burning sulfur forever and ever and ever. Listen, this is not about religion. This is about salvation in Jesus Christ. It's not about just a good idea. It's about eternity. We spend all of our lives for a few short years. You know, we work, we toil, we labor so that maybe we'll have some years of retirement and we can experience it. We can uh, enjoy this little bit of time we have here. Can I tell you, this life here is a drop in the bucket compared to all eternity. Listen, you're an eternal being. You'll never cease to exist. Yes, this physical body, this uh, flesh, these, these hands and these muscles and this skin, this, this part of this body will cease to uh, live at one point, but I will always continue to live on in eternity. And so will every person you come in contact with. They're not just a coworker, they're an eternal being. They're not just a neighbor, they're an eternal being. And everybody's going to spend eternity in a place called heaven or a place called hell. And the Bible says, how will they know about the gospel if nobody tells them? If nobody shares the message, how will they know? Friends, that's why we have to open our eyes. So that our vision is not completely dominated by earthly things and earthly cares. But that our vision would be that of the heart of the Father. I want to show you a video 
that I came across a couple of years ago. The video, I'll be honest with you, the video is not the highest quality video you'll ever see. The words are what I want you to hear. They are uh, the words, it is a recounting of a vision. Uh, many of you have heard of um, William Booth. He was the founder of the Salvation Army uh, back in the 1800s. And he was going, strolling through uh, the streets of London. And as a result, God gave him a vision. And that vision was written down. And so this video I want to show you this morning is a recounting of that vision. And uh, once, once that the video is done playing, then I just want to close our time that we have together this morning. Brother Wayne. I had a vision. I saw a dark and stormy ocean. In that ocean, I thought I saw multitudes of poor human beings plunging and floating and shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And out of this dark, angry ocean, I saw a mighty rock that rose up with its summit towering high above the stormy seas. And all around the base of the rock, I saw a vast platform. And on this platform, I saw with delight a number of the poor wretches continually climbing out of the angry ocean. And I saw that some of those who were already safe on the platform were fervently helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach safety. But something puzzled me. Although they had all been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. Anyway, the memory of its darkness and danger no longer troubled them. And what was equally strange and perplexing to me was that most of these people did not seem to have any care, that is, any agonizing care, about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their eyes. But then I saw something wonderful. I saw a great being from above come straight from his palace, right through the dark clouds. And he leapt right into the raging sea among the drowning people. And there I saw him toiling to rescue them until the sweat of his great anguish ran down in blood. And he was continually crying to those already rescued, to those whom he had helped with his own bleeding hands, to come and help him in the painful and laborious task of saving the lost. But the strangest thing of all was that those on the platform to whom he called were so taken up with their trades and professions and money saving and pleasures and families and community and gatherings and religions and arguments about it that they did not respond to the cry that came to them from this wonderful being who had himself by his spirit gone down into the sea. And so the multitude went on struggling and shrieking and drowning in the darkness. And then I saw something that seemed stranger than anything that had happened before in this very strange vision. Those whom this wonderful being cried out to to come and help him in his difficult task were always praying and crying to him to come to them. Some wanted him to come and stay with them and spend his time and strength in making them happier. Others wanted him to come and take away various doubts and misgivings they had concerning the truth of some letters which he had written them. Others wanted him to come and make them feel more secure on the rock, so secure that they would be totally sure they would never slip off again. They used to meet and get as close to the rock as they could, and looking towards the mainland where they thought the great being was, they would cry out, Come to us, come and help us. But all this time, he was down among the poor drowning creatures, crying to them in a hoarse voice, Come to me, come and help me. And then I understood it all. It was plain enough. That sea was the ocean of life, the sea of real actual human existence. 
Those multitudes of people struggling in the stormy sea were the billions of sinners from every race, language, and nation. That great sheltering rock was Calvary, the place of the cross. And the people on it were those who had been rescued from sin and hell and who professed to be followers of Jesus Christ. That mighty being who called to them from the tempest was the Son of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is still struggling to save the dying multitudes about us from this terrible doom of damnation, and whose voice can be heard above the music and machinery and noise of life, calling on the rescued to come and help him save the world. My friends in Christ, you are rescued from the waters. You are on the rock. Jesus is in the dark sea, calling on you to come and help him. Will you go? Father, this morning I ask you to speak to our hearts. Lord, may we open our eyes and see with your eyes. May our hearts feel what your heart feels. When we see our neighbors and our friends, co-workers and neighbors, may we see them the way you see them, Lord. People that you have compassion for. People that you love and that you care for eternal beings, eternal. Father, help us today, Lord, as we open our eyes, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do something, Lord, on the inside of us today. God, we don't need stirred. We need changed. Help us, Lord. Lord, may we walk in obedience to your word. Let us begin to share the gospel. Let us open our eyes and see. It's not another day we need to wait for. It's now. It's not just Africa. It's not just South America. It's right here. You want to use us right here. God, would you speak to our hearts today? Help us to step out of our comfort zones, to reach down and to pull those out of the stormy sea, to reach out to them who are in need. God, let us today have your heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, if you'll just keep your heads bowed for just a few moments, please, this morning. Friend, if you've come to this church today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ loves you more than you can even imagine. Jesus Christ came to this earth not to just be a good man, a prophet, a teacher. But Jesus Christ came and he gave his life on a whole rugged cross. And he did it so that you and I might be saved. Friend, maybe you're here and you're away from Jesus. You say, you know what? I, maybe I knew him as a kid when I was young, I went to church and I knew him, but you say I'm away from him. Maybe you're here and you've been saying, you know what, we need to get back into church. We need to turn our lives over to Christ. I don't know what the circumstance, but friend, if you're here today in this church and your relationship with Jesus Christ is not what it needs to be or not what it could be or should be, I'm not here to embarrass you, but I just ask where your head's about I'd like to remember you in prayer. If, if that's you and you say, my relationship with Jesus, I, I need a new relationship with Jesus. 
If that's you, would you just lift your hand right where you're at? Yes. 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 Friend, you can put your hand down after you've raised it. Others that might join these that have lifted a hand and just say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I want to lead us in a prayer. Friend, if you believe in your heart when we pray this prayer, I believe with all of my heart, Jesus will come in and be the Lord and Savior of your life. And it'll be the starting place. So all across the church, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. And today I declare, I need you to be my Savior. Would you forgive me of my sin? Come into my life and be my Lord. Lord Jesus, in this moment, I believe you can make me ready for heaven. I believe that you died on a cross and you rose again that I might be saved. And today, I receive the forgiveness of my sin. And today, I receive your salvation in my life. From this day forward, I will live my life for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, I believe today with you, if you prayed the prayer from your heart, listen, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe you are forgiven. I believe salvation has come to you, and heaven is your eternal destination. I want to talk to you now as a church. Friends, he's called us to be a mission field. To where we go out and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. You go into a mission field every day. I go into a mission field every day. You know, I work at the church. Most of the people at the church when I work are saved. At least I pray they are. <laughs> but you know what? I may work here among other believers. But when I leave, I go to lunch every day. And I go to lunch around people who aren't. And you wouldn't believe the relationships that Paul and I have met with, made with people in restaurants. We walk in and we've known them by name. They know us by name. What a shame if I do that day after day after day and I never share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Friend, maybe your mission field is you work at Walmart or Meyer or a factory or it's a school. Friend, you can share the gospel wherever he's placed us. This morning what I'd like to do if you would stand with me. Paul is going to sing a, a chorus. And what I'd like to ask you to do, if your prayer today is that you want to be a light to shine in the darkness, you want to be a witness for him, you want to be a missionary in your mission field, if that's the prayer of your heart, would you, as she begins to sing, would you step out from where you're at and make your way to the front of this church? We're going to pray together today. And I believe God's going to do something incredible in our hearts today. Would you come as she sings? Give myself away. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Use us, Lord. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Just make your way to the front. I give myself away so you can use me. Give myself away. Lord, will you use us? Use us. I give myself away so you can use me. Give myself away. Give myself away so you 
can use me. Here's the challenge to you and to me. Jesus said, open your eyes. I know often we think a missionary just goes to Africa. But friends, Africa is not the only place where the lost are at. They're in your neighborhood. They're in your workplace. They're in your community. They're in the restaurant you frequent. They're at the store where you go. Today, Jesus' words to us is this. Open our eyes. Friends, I don't need, don't misunderstand me, I don't need the Lord to open my eyes. I need to open my eyes. I need to get my eyes off of Jerry and all that Jerry wants and thinks and open my eyes to what's around me because Jesus said the harvest is ready. We just need to open our eyes. And so this morning, I'd like to pray. And as we do, I want to encourage you to do something. I'm going to do it, and I want to encourage you to make a declaration. Lord, I'm opening my eyes. I'm opening my eyes. And Lord, as I open my eyes, help me to see them. Help me to see them. And Lord, as I see them, help me to share the gospel with them. Listen, friend, you may be here and you say, you know what, Pastor? I'm pretty shy and it's not my personality. Listen, I can promise you something. You're no more shy than I am. You have no idea how shy this preacher is. All we need to do, you say, I'm afraid. Listen, just share the gospel afraid. Don't let fear keep you from sharing the gospel. If you say, yeah, I'm afraid I'll stutter, then share the gospel stuttering and trust that he'll help you. If you say, yeah, but I'm afraid my mind will go blank and I won't know to say. Well, just start saying something and trust that he'll put the words when you need them. Because that's the kind of God. Why? Because it's his mission. You and I are just responding to his mission. So would you bow your heads with me this morning? And I'm going to make that declaration, Lord, out my eyes. And I want to encourage you, make that declaration this morning. Lord Jesus, in this place and before these people, we stand together in your presence. I declare, Lord, that I'm opening my eyes. I declare, Lord, I'm going to get my attention off of Jerry. So much, Lord, that I can begin to see the people around me. And Lord, as my brothers and sisters and I open our eyes, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to see them the way you see them. God, I pray that our heart will be your heart. God, fill us with compassion. Fill us with compassion, I pray. Fill us with compassion. God, turn away our hard hearts. And give us a heart of compassion. Help us to see them the way you see them. And Lord, help us to speak up. Lord, if we're afraid, Lord, I pray that as we begin to speak, you'll give us boldness. I pray, God, as we don't know sometimes the words to say, Lord, if we don't know anything more than just say, you know what, Jesus loves you. Lord, I pray that you'll give us the words we need. And I pray, God, you'll use us to be a light. Because, Lord, just as we were without you one day, there's a world of people that are without you. And, Lord, you didn't save us to give us a church seat to sit on. You saved us that we might be missionaries to share the gospel, to help pull others out of the stormy sea, to help reach down and pull others out to a place of safety. So, Lord, use us, I pray. Use us. Let our life be useful in your hands, God. Let our lives be useful in your hands. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you. I give you my hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my mouth. Use them, Lord, for your glory. Use them for your honor. Use them, Lord, for your praise. I pray. 
And God, I know that you've heard the prayers of these men and women today. I know you've heard the prayers of their heart. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll answer and respond. I know, God, you take serious every time your people talk to you. Lord, I pray you'll take it really serious today. And God, do exceeding abundantly above all they can ask or imagine, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Friends, I encourage you in this. As you begin to look around you, he's going to show you some people. He's going to begin to speak to your heart. Don't let fear keep you from reaching out to somebody. Don't let anxiety keep you from reaching out. If you have to do it afraid, then do it afraid. The boldness will come once you start. You won't need the boldness before you start. When you start, he'll come along and give you everything that you need. Speak up for Jesus. Be a light to shine. May the word of the Lord be blessed in your heart and in your life and in your spirit today. May the word of God be blessed in your soul. May the word of God lead you and guide you. May the word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light for your pathway. May the word of God be quick and powerful and alive in your life. May God's word be a promise you cling to, a hope that strengthens you, and a shelter in the time of a storm. May his word accomplish more in your life than you can begin to ask or even imagine. May it be so in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and our Lord. I declare it today over your life and into your life. We love you. Our prayers for you. And our prayer is that God will do more through your life, friend, than you can even begin to imagine. So now I encourage you, when you walk out the door today, you're going to enter the mission field. Go and be missionaries wherever he sends you. God bless you. Have a great day today. May the joy of the Lord always be your strength. God bless.